Hi there, I'm Andy, a moon chasing, manifesting, wander lover, and feel good aficionado. Consider me your woo woo best friend. This show is a sacred space for ideas, concepts, and modalities that might be considered taboo, but that I personally find a great magic in. In these conversations, my mission is to inspire confidence, worth, and mystical thinking in our modern world. Let's get into it, shall we? Hello, everybody. Welcome to another interview episode. This is our 27th episode, which means this show is officially over six months old, which I don't know. I feel like this show has always been a part of what we're up to over here. And we have so much good stuff planned for later this fall, some things we're working on for the new year. I'll go ahead and give you a a small teaser, a little, a little spoiler Starting with season two, which will launch in 2022, we will turn the show into a video podcast, or it's not really we're turning the show into a video podcast. The show will simultaneously become a video podcast. So you will be able to get your episode on Spotify or Apple Pods or wherever it is you like to get your show. And or if you prefer YouTube, you'll be able to go over to YouTube and watch the entire interview uncut, unedited. Not like we cut and edit very much, but sometimes we go a little longer in the conversation or talk about things that don't make it in the final edit. So if you're interested in that, you'll have an opportunity to go and see that as well. So we're super excited that that's coming. We're working on all the plans. We're going to have a season two launch party So that's coming too, which will include all sorts of great things like prizes and gifts and special things in that regard. And yeah, that's what's happening. So before we get into the show, many of you saw what happened around the Lion's Gate, which by the time this comes out, we are... Okay, so today as I'm recording this, this is... Today is Monday, August 16th. This episode will be out this Thursday. Last Sunday was the Lionsgate portal, and we had a little, we had some stuff going on, some of our work for from WeWe, which is our resource hub for all things mystical. Some of our work was reshared on a big celebrity page without credit, and There was a lot of you that were going to bat for us, for our team, for myself and Fatih, who wrote those pieces that were reshared without credit. And I have to just tell you all that there was a good ending to that story. And a very personal and genuine note, the mistake was acknowledged and owned completely, completely owned. So if you don't know what I'm talking about at all, and you're like, what? Who's the celebrity? Give me the tea, sister. Like, what's up? We shared it in the newsletter. I shared it on Instagram. And I think I'm going to leave it at that. Our beautiful writer, Fati, shared on her Instagram, I love how this situation that started with a lot of shadow found a lightful resolution. The moral of the story, from my perspective, is that we're all so much more connected than we may think. Hello, universe. And we're all magnificently human. You know, we all make mistakes. And the celebrity who has 45 million Instagram followers, would we have loved to have been credited the day she made that post? Of course. Would that have brought more attention over to what we're doing on wewegirl.com? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I acknowledge that we're human beings and she made a mistake and that we're all interested in raising the collective vibration. And so that's what we have to do. And shaming and finger pointing and creating a narrative about something that isn't going to support any of us truly going forward isn't, isn't just isn't how I feel like this needed to be handled. And so A story that started with a lot of shadow found a lightful resolution. I agree with that in full. So here we are. Okay, 
So let's get into the episode, shall we? Let's get into the episode. I have a guest today. I'm so excited for you all to meet my guest. I actually had an opportunity to meet her in person after we had our podcast interview, and she's just completely full of beautiful energy, light. She's such a joy. It's Christy Christensen, and she's a global embodiment coach whose mission is to empower women and expand their definitions of yoga and well-being. She's the creator of Soul Fire, a unique style of yoga that incorporates dance, meditation, and mudra practices, yes, a woman after my own heart, to awaken and empower you. She's the co-founder of a yoga school in Asia. She has a a U.S.-based yoga program as well called Deep Exhale, and she incorporates transformational experiences merging the worlds of breath, music, and movement. So she has a lot going on. And with all of that, she also, in 2020, wrote her very first book, and it's called Chakra Rituals, Awakening the Wild Woman Within. And it's out this week with St. Martin's Press. It's a self-help guide that makes the ancient science of chakras accessible through a seven-week step-by-step program. Her story is absolutely incredible and inspiring. When Christy was 16, she transitioned to platform diving after many years As a stage performer and a gymnast, she started training in gymnastics on a world level at 10 years old. She transitioned to platform diving. She was training with the U.S. Olympic diving team, and her Olympic dreams were cut short, and her spirit totally crushed after a devastating back injury. She was determined to heal her body, to reignite her spirit. And she embarked on a path of spiritual discovery, and that brought her to her first yoga class. And we we are so grateful that yoga was what she found her way into. She shifted her focus to heal herself, and while doing that, she found this path to helping others heal and awaken through embodiment movement. So let's get into it. Welcome, my guest, the beautiful, the magical... Christy Christensen. Good morning, Christy. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you here. It's such an honor and a pleasure. We've already been chatting a little bit. So, you know, I have to just say, I'll say it again. I'm so excited for your book. I'm so excited to get to know more about it. And congratulations on this beautiful launch that's coming, coming now, really coming. Yes. Soon. Yeah. Coming so soon. Thank you so much. And I know, you know, this process, <laughs> so I know, you know, exactly how I feel right now. And it's been such a, um, a labor of love. It's been such a digging into the depths of my soul and facing every single demon, every single saboteur and showing up anyway, and to bring forth the, the truth of what what I truly believe that spirit wanted me to share. Oh, so beautiful. So beautiful. Yeah. Doing this sort of creative work, you, you can't step into creativity at that level and share voice at that level without doing that deep dive into the soul. Yes. And interestingly enough, I started really writing the book two weeks before COVID hit. (laughs) So also dealing with kind of the collective, I mean, my own personal trauma with, you know, dealing with the loss of everything in terms of my own work outside of writing and dealing with the collective fear and scare at the same time. So even trying to get to that creative place to be able to actually decipher through the anxiety, through the fear of the current situation to connect in with my soul was also a mm-hmm. really big challenge that I had to face like every day, every day <laughs> every for the first day. several months. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to get to know all about what's happening in the book. And before we do that, we always start the show with a, with a little bit of astrology. So tell us about your big three. Tell us your sun, your moon, and your rising sign so we can get to know you a little bit further. 
Yes, my uh, son is a Capricorn, Mm -hmm. and uh, I definitely have some of the real traditional Capricorn. I'm stubborn for sure, (laughs) and I can be very pragmatic and organized when it's necessary. Mm -hmm. Um, My moon is in Gemini, so I, you know, that's probably like where the travel part of me really comes out. As I like, even though I have the really rooted groundedness of Capricorn, I like to fly free. Very much so. And then uh, my rising is what most people guess when most people are like, I bet I know what your sign is. And most people right. guess that I'm a Leo because of my hair. Yes. And I kind of look like a lion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know that that rising sign is that face we put to the world so often. Yes. So, yes. And also yes. you and I have our rising and our sun in common just flip-flopped. So I'm, a, yeah, I'm a Leo sun and a cap rising. Wow. Well, we're going to be fast, fast, fast. We're going to be fast, fast, fast friends. <laughs> I know. Well, and the funny thing is, for those that have listened to like every episode of the show, we have this running theme now that the number one sign that we have on the show is Capricorn. We have so really? many folks with Capricorn in their chart. And at the beginning of the show, when we first started, when we first started recording last spring, we we said, okay, well, it's because Capricorns are just really organized. And when we reach out and we, we book them for the show, they're like ready to get the date, ready to get scheduled. And so when we're trying to get our, or, you know, or, or Virgos too would be that way. Mm-hmm. But when we're trying to get our Pisces people or our, our Aquarius people, they're like, well, we'll figure it out. We'll find a date. But we'll now we think, when the time is right, <laughs> right. you know, exactly. I'm in the flow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And now I'm just like, maybe I'm just attracting in my Capricorn friends for the show because that's, I love it. that's my I rising. Love it. So that's what, what I'm putting out often. So yeah. yeah, it's it's really funny because I have to like I actually have to work at reminding myself that I do have those character traits mm-hmm. by nature. You know, mm-hmm. sometimes the fire and the air can really take over for me. Sure. And I have to be like, oh, where's the grounding? Where's the rooting? You actually do thrive with order. <laughs> so let's restore it. <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, for and for me growing up, having that Leo. I, of course, mm-hmm. when you're when when you're just getting into astrology, for most of us, it's like you know about your sun sign, and you only yeah. really know about your sun sign. So, I knew about my Leo sun sign, and so, and I, and at the same time, I was really good in sciences and math growing up, mm-hmm. and and those sorts of subjects in school, and it was confusing to me because I was like, I want to be on stage. I have all this like want to, you know, I had the Leo stuff. I had this want to be seen. And then I was like, and I really love like being in the lab, working on like the detailed stuff. So I was like, what is this weird duality? And then of course, as I got to know more about my chart was like, Oh, there it is. It's my, it's that cap rising. That's like, absolutely doing that, that other piece. Yeah. Yes. And I, I have similar, but different, uh, the first time, like I was learning the same thing a little bit about astrology and someone, which I guess now, I mean, this was many, many years ago, was just reading. They were reading my chart, but I don't really understand it now because they were only reading the Capricorn part. Mm-hmm. Like they didn't talk about all the other transits and stuff. So it must have been someone new learning as well. Um, and there was a lot of it that I was like, no, that doesn't. No, I'm not really. <laughs> that's not really me, you know. And then the first time I, you know, was really explained to me these other aspects, Mm -hmm. specifically with the rising and even with the moon um, and the air, I I think of everything elementally. So that understanding that just like brought everything together to me in in a different way. And then I was like, oh, now this makes sense. I felt like the person was describing me to me better than I could have described myself. And I was like, oh, because there's all these facets and yeah. uh, layers and dimensions that, you know, bring forth the, the refinements and everything else of who we are. Yeah. Yeah. So let that be a lesson for anyone who only knows their sun sign. Go, yeah. go check out your chart in full. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So I'm so excited to get into your story. I'm I'm so thrilled about your coming book, but let's start with yeah. your background. You have such an interesting background. You've done, you've done so much. We also have in common. I have to tell you, I grew up in North Carolina, and I know that you went to school no in North. Yeah, yes. I was in Charlotte, and I know you were in Winston wow. Salem. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I love it. More yeah. things in common. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. So tell us, tell us your story, and you're up to so many beautiful things today. But I want to start with where it yeah. all, where it all came from. 
Well, let's 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 do the condensed version the best I can. Yeah. I um I was actually born in Brooklyn, New York, and my mom was a dancer. And we lived in an apartment on top of her dancing school. Oh. So from moment one, movement and music were ingrained into my psyche, my spirit, my soul. My mom actually danced. I was born a little over a month early. She was like kicking and twirling, <laughs> um, like literally the day I came out. My dad goes to work and she said, for whatever reason, don't go. For, he was a salesman at the time. Like, don't go too far today. Like, I might have my baby because she was going to just have her checkup. So she goes wow. to the doctor and she was already like dilated 10 centimeter or 10 um, uh, millimeters. And, and, and the doctor's like, no, no, you're in labor. And she's like, no, 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 I'm a dancer. I'm flexible. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, no, 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 that's not flexible. <laughs> so needless to say, literally she was dancing up into the very moment that I came out. And that is, I, 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 I find that in, important or interesting or relevant because I really do think those nine months I spent in the womb uh, were really part of my my soul's work, you know, that that so much of my life is about movement. So much of my life is about uh, music and dance and, and this integration of mind, body, spirit. So uh, fast forward, she had us dancing by the time we could walk. <laughs> and I then also got into gymnastics and I was training uh, at a very, very young age. Um, I was like handpicked to be on this like Olympic track with this coach. And then we got up and we moved to North Carolina. And it was a little bit devastating because I was like, wait a second, all my dreams are here. I mean, you know, yeah. I'm, again, I'm 10 years old, but still like it was, yeah. that's how young all of this uh, began. And I started dancing at the School of the Arts um, and in preparation actually for the gymnastics, but it from dancing at such an early age, the same thing. I was very adept in that. I actually had an astrology reading. I'll share this. Uh, many years later, about 10, 15 years ago, that basically said if I would have been born like five years earlier, the way my transits were hitting, like I was like hitting, the reason I was so good so young is like I was hitting that like peak of like experience at age like six, seven, eight, where she's like, if you would have like if you just would have hit it like 10, 11, 12, like you probably would have made it all the way to the Olympics and all those wow. things, you know? So it was interesting to learn that later on in life of even how those kinds of things showed up in my chart in some way. Cause she was like, there's some powerful time. What were you doing? Um, and then my life was all about that. It was all about the gymnastics, all about the dance until I had to make a choice mm -hmm. of which one I was going to devote full time. And I ended up choosing gymnastics and it was my blood, my sweat, my tears, my everything. Um, and then I broke my back mm -hmm. and that I was 14 and it felt like my world was crashing down because yeah. I knew nothing else. Like literally from age six before school, after mm -hmm. school, I didn't go on family vacations. I, my whole life revolved around this, this one goal. And it was, my parents made me quit at that time. They were like, no more. This is where I was in this back brace. Like I was sitting, I was yeah. sleeping, sitting upward, the whole thing. And after, as I was going through the healing process, my gymnastics coaches were like, well, why don't you try diving? Like maybe diving, hitting the water would be, right. you know, less, um, uh, impact or not as hard on your body. So of course I go home that day. I'm like, mom, dad, I want to try diving. Uh, the strong will in me, I guess, of the Capricorn and the fire of the Leo was, I was not giving up on being able to try this other thing. Yeah. So long story long, I end up moving to Florida to go train at this training center. I mean, they sent me away to a camp and yeah. I have got very good very quickly. And the coach was like, you have to move here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so well, you somehow, already had that, like, the bo the body work was already there for the gymnastics. So now you were just applying it to a different platform, literally. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's, I mean, gymnastics and diving can pair together very beautifully. Otherwise, starting a sport like that at 15. Sure. It's, you know, there's only so far you can go. But with that background is why I was able to transition. And you know, one thing that actually comes with gymnastics is a fearlessness that's, you know, can be dangerous too, but where a lot of people get stuck is the fear of doing things. And, yeah. you know, from such a young age, I was doing such crazy things that I didn't have that. I didn't really have that. If I had all the trust in my coach and if my coach said I could do something, I believed it like the word of God. Like it was pretty, pretty wild. Um, went on to new Olympic dream was to go to the Olympics and diving, 
Um, I broke my back a second time. Oh I was training goodness. to, I was training to, for the, to the 2004 Olympics at that time. Uh-huh. I was training at the training center in the Woodlands, Texas. My best friend won the, 20, the 2000 Olympics who just competed again in the, just the most recent Olympic trials, making a comeback at 43. Go um, ahead. Yes. Yeah. So incredible. So incredible. Um, and that was, that was the end of that period of my life, so to speak. So just so from the time, again, from the time I could walk basically till 24 was this journey of, of using my body in this way to achieve. And it was also using my body in this way, not knowingly, of course, in terms of my identity, like this is who I was. I was the diver. I was the gymnast. I was the Olympian. I was, and once that was taken away, um, for the second time, um, I, I was, I had just went to the depths of despair. I, um, I didn't know what life was like without that focused, pointed mm-hmm. vision. And I didn't know what I was good at. I didn't know, I had no other dream. I mean, there was no other dream on the table. Like this was, this was it. Um, and I like fought the doctors tooth and nail and they literally were like, you're going to be walking with a cane at the age of 30. Like you have to, like your spine is in the condition of like a 75 year old woman, you Mm -hmm. know? And so obviously I had to come to terms with that and went on this big healing. I thought healing journey of my physical body, but it really turned into a healing journey of my emotional body and a returning home to my spiritual body. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is through this process, again, and it was a slow process. I found yoga. I found breath work. I found things that I didn't know were spiritual practices. I didn't have any reference of what a spiritual practice was. I thought there was religion and then there was exercise. I didn't have any understanding there was a crossover between the two. Even when someone took me to yoga, like I had no, I thought I was just, that was another form of exercise, like going to Pilates or, or whatever else. And, but slowly this curiosity and slowly this awakening of all the other dimensions of myself, all the other bodies of myself, meaning my, again, emotional body, my mental body, my spiritual body, my bliss body even, like, was like, what, what is this? And didn't have the language yet to, um, to be able to, to express what was happening, but the curiosity was ignited. And I was like, whatever this is, I got to know, I got to know more, you know, whatever this is, I have to know more. And it was the first time that I, um, in a very long time or since that I could remember, even though I grew up Catholic, that I felt connected to something larger than myself. Yeah, And the deeper connection I got in tune with my body through this breath by breath practice of yoga, I realized how much of the time I spent out of my body. Mm-hmm. And even doing a sport at such an elite level, standing 33 feet up in the air, spinning three and a half times, hitting the water at 30 miles an hour, I realized how much of the time I was out of my body, yeah. which to think about that now is super frightening in a way, sure. right? And through this process, um, repressed trauma came up, tons of repressed memories, uh, ab- abuse. I, I mean, my world just was like, you know, coming up from uh, from the depths inside of me. Um, and it really just propelled me on this total metamorphosis, so to speak, um, that has literally continued for 20 years. Like there's just deeper revelations and deeper understandings and then plateaus and then integration again and deeper learning. And it's been a never ending journey, but, um, I, I didn't rush to teach yoga right away. Uh, it was something that I did for myself. I was in the wellness world. I taught other exercise modalities. I managed yoga studios and uh, mind body uh, wellness centers. Um, There was one I helped launch in New York City called Exhale, and they ended up opening many locations around the US that I bounced around and helped open and um, until I ended up in Los Angeles. Um, And one of the teachers that I managed one day got in my face and was like, why aren't, what are you resisting? Why, mm-hmm. why are you not sharing your voice as a teacher? Like you've done everybody's training. Cause that was how I wanted to, I just was, I wanted to learn. So I would just take everybody's, you know, workshops and classes and whatever I could go to and just really wanted to learn. And, um, it really came down to 
because of the journey that I was still in the midst of very much at that time, I felt so vulnerable and so raw. And I felt like my insides were on the outside in so many ways. And I was Mm -hmm. like, how do I share a practice like this with people? Mm -hmm. And I was terrified. Um, But I did know at the same time I was hiding. And And it scared me to death. And that was why I knew I needed to do it because I hadn't been scared to death since probably the last time I stood on the 10 meter platform learning a new dive for the first time. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So you, you know what fear looks like and you know how Mm -hmm. to face it. And you have some rituals that you share that support Mm -hmm. women. Mm Mm-hmm support all people, but you do a lot yeah. of work with women yes. and really finding their confidence by facing fear. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, I mean, the first thing I really, I have, you know, and again, all still <laughs> constant work in progress, right? Because fear is something we're faced with almost on the daily, right? We, mm-hmm. we know that specific from this time that we're coming out of right now. And, um, you know, to continue to go back to the remembrance that Fear is real. It's not imaginary, right? And it actually is a healthy response, right? Fear is what does in many ways, it keeps us alive. It keeps us from doing really stupid stuff, right? right? But then (laughs) the difference between the fear that keeps us from living versus the fear that keeps us alive and recognizing on which side of fear we're operating on, Mm -hmm. right? And for me, I always lean into when if if the, 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 the scariness, right, if, if that, that, that uncertainty of not knowing, being that in that subliminal space of if I don't do this, the fear of not living, right, if I can allow my, if I can let myself imagine that if I don't do this, if I go into that fear, it's normally going into that place that's like, oh, no, 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 I'm not giving up this opportunity to actually really live my life or to actually have the kind of relationship I want to have or to actually go get the training to go after the job I want or to face this person, have that difficult conversation. I, that's the place I tried to go into of like yeah. what, how it keeps me from living and do I want that fear to be the fear that ru- uh, rules my life? Right. And often that fear is, becomes more powerful and it's like, oh no, no, I'm not... <laughs> going to do that. I'm not going to live this way anymore in this circumstance. It might mean tomorrow I have to face it all over again, but um, I, I tried to make it really specific of, of what I'm dealing with on the, the day to day. And then it's when you go into that manageable place of like moment by moment, right? It's much easier to face and know, come back to our grounding, come back to our root in our first chakra. Okay, what is real? Okay, what is actually real here? What is the real fear, right? Mm-hmm. What is real in my body right now, All right? Do I have the energy? Do I have the stability to actually move closer to this? Or do I actually need to step back right now? So that's how I kind of um, like to investigate the fear and to have respect for it, but not to be like, so scared of it that I can't actually look at or have maybe be so scared of it, but have the courage to look it in the face anyway and be like, okay, like what is, what is here to help me transform? What is coming up to maybe be healed so that I can get to the next step in my own evolutionary growth and, and um, awakening. Yeah. So powerful and so important. And as often as we like to think that we can turn away from the fear, suppress it, mm-hmm. walk away from it, not not have to spend any time with it, that reminder that it's real. And it's absolutely and it's it's not it it doesn't it doesn't hold a negative or a positive charge. It's just it is what it is. And we, it's energy. we can work with it. Yeah. Yes, it's energy and it's a powerful energy. And if we can learn to harness it and direct it in a way to actually propel us forward, it can be super powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. one of my teachers always says um, you know, if the, if we ignore the fear, it just persists. It just gets stronger. Oh, yeah. So we can suppress it all we <laughs> want, but we're actually just feeding it. We're yeah. feeding the demon underneath the surface until it gets so big that it is pressing on our chest that we can't move, that we're paralyzed. And, um, you know, it really keeps, it can't, that's when it comes to the place that it's keeping us from living. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I have a question about... Yes. 
self-care and how you mm -hmm. how you've incorporated self-care into your life it's something we talk a lot about around here yeah. after that experience that you had as an athlete and you t you mentioned being in this place of being really out of body just really out of body how did you find your way into a new relationship with your body and what does self-care look like for you today yeah. um self-care is a daily coming home to a place of self-love within me mm -hmm. of, of actually, I mean, right now I know you guys can't see me, but I, I'm taking my hand across my chest and I'm rubbing my heart, right? It is actually honoring the temple that I live in. And sometimes people think that word sounds woo woo or ridiculous, but for me, it's, it, so much of my healing has been about a new understanding of this gift of this body and the true gift of embodiment and that the whole body is sacred. I, um, from a very young age, also on this crazy athletic journey I was on, I developed severe eating disorders uh, to the point where I do believe I had some angels watching over me because I probably should not be alive right now. Mm -hmm. With the amount of abuse I was doing and the amount of training I was doing simultaneously, yeah. no wonder why my back broke twice. I mean, if I'm really honest, even though that's so hard for me to admit because there's so much shame around that, that like actually sure. maybe I'm to blame for all this in a way that I didn't reach my goal, so on and so forth. So I, my body was a tool. It was a vessel to be able to do all this stuff. I also was a survivor of, of physical and sexual abuse. And so I think my escape mechanism was this crazy training, right? Diving so deeply into all these athletic endeavors because that was safer, right? To, to fling myself off a 30 foot platform than to deal with the reality of my, you know, my situations. And then once that was gone, right, that's where I'm saying this new integration really, and I was left to deal with everything I was using, maybe the sports, the food, um, to, to try to process on some level. So as I was, um, it, it really came back to, of, of me coming into, on the simplest level, loving contact with my body, of actually looking at my body in the mirror and accepting it for exactly the way it was and honoring every cell, every organ and every tissue and literally saying, thank you for not giving up on me, even though I gave up on you a long time ago. Yeah, And that's still part of my daily practice because I... I, I'm so, so, so grateful that now, almost 20 years later, um, I have an amazing relationship with my body. And I'm like, I can't, like the older I get, I'm so, I'm like, oh my gosh, look what my body can still do and how much energy it holds and how strong yeah. it is and how mobile it is. And I can't believe that I could not see that before, right? So it is like, I have to be in constant contact and touch. So I do different practices from um, from the yoga tradition, one called Abhyanga, where it's as simple as self-massage, right? Just to bring you back. And anytime I feel like my energy is going out of my head or I am disconnecting because it's a difficult situation, because that is my automatic, I literally just squeeze my body. And I'm like, oh, there I am. There I Beautiful. am. I breathe yeah. deeply. I breathe. I imagine breathing down deep and wide into like allowing spirit to descend down into me and then out through the channels of the legs and root me into the earth versus trying to breathe up and out. So for me, it's everything is this, this coming home, this honoring. And for me, this is the path of the feminine, yeah, this, so this downward path of embodiment. Yeah. Yeah. And as we, as we get older, it is, there's this just something that starts to happen when we, we begin to have this awareness of, of how sacred this home, this, this body, this skin suit that we live in, yes, how sacred yes. it truly is. And it's, uh, I, I have those same thoughts. I look back in, at how I treated, how I treated this temple in my twenties, in my teens and in my twenties. Yeah. And, and now I'm, I'm like so filled with gratitude for yeah. what I can do. I was talking to a girlfriend yesterday and, and we were talking about just some of the different, some of the different modalities we're both really interested in and some new things we're trying. And I was telling her about a, a new practice I was, I was exploring and, 
And she just had her first baby about a year and a half ago. So we were having that okay. conversation. And just, just talking with other women about the power that our bodies hold is so special too, just to Absolutely. be in awe of ourselves. Well, and to be in awe, and I've not had a child, but to really, like, it's become it, what most people do, right? So I think we so much lose, like, the magic and the mystery of, like, holy freaking shit. Yeah. Excuse my language. Like, I am growing a toe right now that our body <laughs> actually moves yes. around to create the space. It produces the milk. That's the exact ingredients that the minerals and the nutrients the baby needs. Like, the fact that our body has this insane intelligence that it can grow a healthy vibrant being is beyond it's and that's pure magic I, it's yeah. pure magic and that's where i get frustrated with some of the spiritual traditions that say it is just a skin sack because i'm like yeah. no it's not like it's our vehicle <laughs> for this life but yeah. it is utter magic utter like and to me all energy is spiritual physical and energetic it's all it's all spiritual yeah so I, I think part of the healing of of the body or coming home to it is remembering and being in awe of the magic and the mystery of actually yeah. what it's doing moment by moment. And thank God we don't have to think about doing all of it. It just does it on its own. <laughs> it just does it. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> you know? uh, so amazing. Okay, so I want to talk about the book. So the book is called Chakra Rituals, Awakening the Wild Woman Within. So yeah. I want to know all about this awakening of the wild woman, and I want to know how the book came to be. So so give it to us. How did the book come yeah. to be? And, and talk to me about awakening the wild woman within. So um, the cho- on, early on my yoga journey, the chakras are what really lit me up. So the chakras, for those of you that don't know, they're just the energy centers in the body. There's seven main ones, and they all hold a different intelligence, a different genius, or I like to say their own superpower. So each one is as valuable as the one above or below it. It's just each of them. It's, a, um, it's really about embracing the full diversity of our being and recognizing we're not just one thing, but we're we're full of color, dynamic power, and light. And in my 20 years almost of teaching, that's what I I teach off of the chakras, whether I mention the word chakra or not. Like that's yeah. that's how I, I see the world. My best friend says through chakra colored glasses. Like that's, this is the map that I use for empowerment, for transformation, for healing, because it makes sense to me and it works for, um, for, for my life. And so this tie in with this awakening the wild woman is i believe to awaken the wild woman we have to return back to nature we have to return back to our roots which is the first chakra which is coming embodied and coming home and honoring the gifts of this physical form right it is also awakening our sensual prowess right giving ourselves permission to feel all that we feel and not be not be just like tossed aside by being hysterical women, or it must be that time yeah. of the month and reclaiming the superpower of your sensitivity, right? That's the second chakra. And then the third chakra where oh, we're, we get to rise up, we get to stand up for in dignity. We get to express our power and our voice and say yes to our life, right? So each chakra is a step into awakening what I call the wild woman. And it's coming into your most, your most authentic, your into your most authentic self and fully coming alive because there's so much out there about healing. But I feel like until you come alive and you awaken consciousness, how can you really heal? Yeah. There's so much like for my own healing journey, I didn't need to know what needed to be healed, right? It was, it was suppressed so deeply in me and I'm not alone on this journey, right? And we all have different traumas or abuses. They just look slightly different. You know, and then yeah. we come into the power of, of the heart and we come into our voice and our intuition. And then we finally correct this step of creating the connection to the divine. And we recognize that it's all just divine. And that's where we take the seat of the queen within ourselves. Oh, so, I love it. yeah, I, um, I, 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 for me, it's just, it's such a, it's such a map that's like I said, color and it's full of color and dynamic power and, um, it's, it helps me come alive on a regular regular basis. And so much about even how my teaching career began with that one teacher getting in my face and said, what are you so scared of for me to share? Almost a similar thing happened with writing the book. I had a, I actually had a publisher contact me 
and say, hey, we've been following you and we saw you on a few different you know, conference platforms and we see that your specialty is kind of on the chakras. We're looking for a chakra specific book. And I had the idea for the book, but I assumed it was something I would do way off in the future. Yeah. You know, Uh so that's where I say, like, I feel like this book was brought in by divine grace because it was not on my radar to do anytime soon. But uh, the beauty of the other timing of it being that I had it once, you know, from that initial um, request, it's just started the conversation. And then I have a beautiful teacher, Lauren Roche, who has written many books. And he, I said, do I need, should I write a book? And he was like, do you want to write a book? Do you know anything about writing a book? I'm like, no. <laughs> and he said, well, let me introduce you to my agent just to give you some advice. Yeah. And I got very lucky. She loved the idea. So she signed me and uh, we wrote the proposal and um, I ended up not going with that original publisher. We did send her the proposal, but I ended up going with St. Martin's Press, which is a, a, an amazing publisher, the Mind, Body, Spirit imprint for Macmillan. And I had a job during COVID. Yeah, so if uh, I so, wouldn't so have perfect. done it during this, yeah. So like that was the other piece of the the timing felt like it was all supposed to be happening right then very much. And um it's it's been a tremendous journey of of you know it's it's a combination of the the chakras could be we could have, we could write twenty different books on the chakras literally right um, it's not meant to be a chakra encyclopedia it's meant to take this ancient wisdom and how is it applicable to the modern day woman and how is it going to help serve your life so it's not a book just to read and to contemplate and and um, theoretize. It is a book to experience. Mm. So it takes you on a seven week journey if you choose to do it in the way it's designed. Maybe that's going to be 14 weeks for you. Maybe it's going to be seven years for you. It's going to be up to each person. But each week we go through uh, a chakra and we have different, what I call the empowerment tools or the rituals Mm -hmm. for each day. And they range from creating sacred space in your home to mudra practices, which are the yoga of the hands, meditation, breath practices, uh, short vinyasa practices that I call body prayers and other empowerment rituals. Yes. Yes. I love that body prayers. So, so yeah. And that just shifts just that, just that, that piece, body prayers. It just Mm -hmm. shifts us out of this. Oh, right. Yoga is for exercise into we are we are creating a spiritual connection through body. We are Absolutely. exploring our spirituality through body. I love that. Beautiful. Yes, thank you. And I mean, that's really the goal for to have all these different tools and to give you a lived experience of each of these different energies so that you can start to play with them for yourself. So I also feel like it's a book that you can return to again and again, because once you have this basic understanding, you can tune in to yourself and be like, okay, What do I need today? Okay, actually, I need a little bit more personal power because this, this, and this. I'm going to go to the third chakra chapter and do some of those practices, Mm -hmm. right? And so you can really use the book in a way that is suiting you moment to moment, you know, once you have this a little bit more of an understanding. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, yeah, so I'm really excited to share. There's so much of me in it too, um, just to drive the narrative forward. But uh, yeah. there's definitely um, intertwined with some of my own my own personal story. I can't wait to get my hands on it. It's going to be such a beautiful experience to get to spend those seven weeks exploring, Thank exploring you. that system. And and yeah, it's so powerful. So so powerful. And, and one of the things that I did because it is so practice driven. Um, is I did audio recordings of all the practices and I did video recordings of the body prayers. Oh, awesome. Because, yeah, like how are you going to, okay, step one, get grounded. Step two, close your eyes to the degree of your comfort. (laughs) And then you're going to continue reading. So um, in the book, there's a website that you can go to and you can also just hear my voice and be guided through all the practices as well if that serves you. So cool. So great. Love the interactive experience of having the book and the audio and the video. So, so awesome. So I love that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. It felt necessary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 yeah. And I, and we've, we've spent this last year, so many of us doing so much of our spiritual practices online or connecting mm-hmm. in 
digital ways and finding new new approaches to connect during this this last year of this time of having to kind of reassess everything. And so having something tangible where we've got that book in our hands and we can work through the book and then we have you as the teacher to guide us through in a way that we've gotten really used to used to, to, to doing with these with the um, with so many classes and experiences happening digitally, it'll be such a beautiful combination. Yes, absolutely. Um, and you know, it's, I'm asking a lot of people, you know, I'm asking for people to show up in this way. So I wanted to make it as easy for them as possible. Yeah. I love to hear that. That's so, (laughs) so special. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So I want to ask you about one more thing before we move to our closing questions. So I want to ask you about vulnerability Mm. and you talk about vulnerability and how it's one of our greatest superpowers. Can you share with us your methods for leaning into our vulnerability, especially as we're, the world is starting to reopen where we're, heading back out to face our days in a new way. And we have this opportunity to connect into our vulnerability as a superpower. So what does that look like? And what are your methods around that? So to me, vulnerability is an exquisite act of courage. And if we think of courage um, in like the original sense of the word, which comes from the Latin root core, which means from the heart. So to How do we courageously live from the heart, right? That we we can remain open, right? And we can risk putting ourselves out there and not knowing what the result is going to be. And that result could be meeting a new person, that could be applying for a new job, that could be sharing a new creative idea, right? We, We hit vulnerability at every level. Right. We're not just hitting vulnerability. So many people think think of vulnerability of like we're around love and around, um, you know, in a relationship or if I say I love you first or something like that. But we actually can hit vulnerability at each level of our of our body. Right. Or each level of our experience, because it's anything in which we are putting ourselves out there to be seen, to be heard. Right. To be felt and not knowing what the outcome can be. And so the pillars for me for for vulnerability are self-love, self-respect, and self-esteem. So if our self-esteem particularly is intact, and what I mean by that, we're not putting our self-worth on the line. So I'll use the book for example. So I just wrote this book it was absolutely terrifying and absolutely amazing at the same time. Like on a daily basis, I was like caught between joy and terror, <laughs> not exaggerating. And it feels like, it, it does feel like I'm giving birth. Like it feels like such an extension of me, right? Yeah. But there has to be a line between, is this book wrapped up? Is this book just a pretty package of my own self-esteem and my own self-worth? So if the book does well and people receive it and love it, that means I'm okay. Yeah. And if people don't receive it or don't buy it for any reason, then, then, then who am I and what am I left with? Yeah. Right. So to me, vulnerability really starts from this place of a healthy self-esteem of, of really being able to know we are enough to be in relationship with ourselves at that such a deep level and to be in the relationship with spirit at such that deep level that I'm not putting my self-worth on the line, even as I birthed the biggest project of my life right now. Yeah. Right. And, and there's something about that that gives you a power to more easily take that risk. Mm-hmm. And that we can actually move towards vulnerability versus hiding behind it. Because when we move away from vulnerability, we shrink, we get smaller, we collapse. And even in our posture, you know, our heart tends to cave in, right? Mm -hmm. So we're closing off our heart, our solar plexus collapse. We close off the power, we close off the esteem, right? That if we can actually stand our ground, right, know who we are, align with and no matter if we fly or we fail, it's still a movement forward in a positive direction. So for me, so much of it is having to just like fear of of reframing what we're doing and the work around our own 
knowing that our birthright is worthiness, that we it's not based off of what we achieve. It's not how much money we have in our bank account. It's living an integrated whole life connected to self, connected to spirit, and connected to to whatever it is that your heart's, that's in your heart, you know? Um, So that when I, when I feel like we can live that way, it's in full expanse, right? We can, we can, we can move forth with joy. We can move forth with wonder. We can move forth with, in the words of Benet Brown, with creativity and innovation and change. Yeah. And without that, um, you know, life gets stuck and stagnant and it's not so fun. Yeah. And it, and the last thing I'll say is it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Right. It's hard. It's yeah, not it doesn't easy. mean it's a, a party every day. Exactly. There, yeah, there's some fun along the way. Yes. But yes. it's going to be challenging and so yes. worth it. And it means you're going to grow. It doesn't mean yeah. you're going to be comfortable. <laughs> But it means you're going to grow. And when the reward is what you hoped for, it will be beyond measure. But if you don't even put yourself out there, if you don't even risk being vulnerable, you'll never know. Just like the same thing if we don't risk actually looking our fear face to face, right, and seeing what it is and what's behind it and what it needs. If we don't take that risk, we will actually never know what's on the other side. Yes. Amen to that. Amen. Amen. Okay, I've got five questions for you ah, to close okay. out our time together. Okay. So the first one is, tell us about an object or charm that is special mm. to you. Okay, well, I'm, um, so right now I'm in New York City. I am normally based in Los Angeles, and I air quote that because I um, travel quite a bit. Yeah. And so I always built an altar or a, create a sacred space everywhere I go. So I have two right here. Oh, I actually have a whole altar. But. I, I get to see them so often because the way we record, we can see each other. So I get to see people's special objects and I yes. love this part so much. So tell me about your special objects you have. So there. the first one I have is a pendant of the goddess Durga. Oh, and yes. Durga is um, what's called, to me, I call her my Ishta Devi, which means like your your guiding your guiding teacher, you could you could you could say in regular in layman language, and she is the goddess of we could say the third chakra. She's the goddess of power and of empowerment, and she rides a lion, hence the Leo the Leo part of me. And she's utterly gorgeous. She's dressed in a beautiful sari, and she's dripping in gold, and not a hair is out of place. But at the same time, she's got a sword, and she has all these instruments because she is going to slay the demons of her own mind, right? She's going to fight those battles, right, of her own injustice. She is going to meet all the afflictions of the ego and literally just cut the head off. Right. And again, without, you know, with such regalness, with such, you know, she's the queen. So, um, Durga is who I, um, who I care. I literally, she's in my wallet everywhere I go. Um, and that remembrance of the power that resides in, in, in each, in each of us. Um, and then I have my tarot cards. Uh, Yeah. Um, I I love, I love seeing someone traveling with their cards. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, these, these cards, like I joke around and say they're my best friend. (laughs) Yeah. (gasps) Because they have awoken so much magic, so much intuition, um, into my life and they really do stir, uh, as a, as a touchstone in, in my life for sure. And the, the deck that I use is called the beauty of the tarot. And it was actually designed by my teacher, uh, Brenda Aww. Rose. Um, so they have extra special significance, uh, for me because, um, she's who, who created them. So they go, they also go everywhere around the world with me. <laughs> Beautiful. Yes. Okay. Second question. What okay. is a book that changed your life? The artist way. I was going to ask you if you were an artist way girl, because as we're having this conversation about facing fear and vulnerability, I was like, this every time I backing up every time I've written yeah. a book, the two times I've written a book, I, mm-hmm. I reread the artist way while I'm writing the book. Wow. Oh, yeah. amazing. Yeah. What a good idea. Yeah. So for those that don't know it, Julia Cameron wrote it 25 years ago as it's as this, it's a spirit, it's a spiritual practice of, of reclaiming your inner, your inner artist, artist, your inner creative. And 
and the the kind of one of the core takeaways for those that aren't familiar with it is this practice of the morning pages and you can sit down and really do 30 minutes or three pages whatever whatever you've really got the ability to do but a 30 minute practice is is a really really powerful practice and and then you just you never look at it again you just get get out onto the page whatever it is that needs to flow yeah. Yes. And, and I mean, in some days you might feel stuck and you, I'll literally write over and over again, what I really want to say is, what I really want to say is, and then yeah. by the end, something comes out and it's like, I really want to say I'm freaking angry. That not yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or whatever it might be. Um, the other thing about the book that, uh, I mean, that's the one practice that I have taken with me all this time, but prior to reading that book, I didn't see myself as a creative person. Oh, I, yeah. I was of that construct, like many people are that if you can't sure. write, you can't draw, I'm not, if you can't paint, you can't sing, you know, if you're not producing some kind of art, you are not an artist. Yeah. Yeah. And I very much actually, I write about that in the book in the fifth chakra chapter, because part of the fifth chakra is about, um, reclaiming not only your voice, but your creative expression and yeah. recognizing everything we do as a work of art from the way you dress your clothes Completely. to the way you prepare your food to, uh, I mean, to every aspect of life is everything is a creative aspect. And yes. the fact of how she ties that with spirituality, I was like, that that every act of creation is an act of God. Um, so that, that's such a beautiful thing. And I also love her book. I don't know if you've read Finding Water. No, I haven't. I really heard the Finding Water. I also really enjoyed, uh, that book of hers too, but I read that many years later. Okay. I'll, I'll, pu- I'll put that one on my list. Yes, for sure. Yes. Okay. Next question is this, tell me about an experience or moment that changed your life in a profound way. Ooh. Okay. So besides breaking my back, um, I'm going to say my first trip to India, mm. I uh, went to, um, I was in Southern India and I was with a group of people and we decided to go to Amma's ashram. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Amma, she's known as the hugging saint and her gift that she gives everyone. Well, I don't know what's going to happen now in post COVID times, but her gift before she would give you a hug. And that was like how she blessed you in, in this really enlightened way. So we're on our like this crazy journey to get there. We call the ashram before we leave to make sure she's there because she travels a lot. And we took this crazy journey. We get there and we arrive and we're told she's not there. Mm. And we were like, wait, what? We just did this crazy job. What do you mean she's not here? And they said, but no, please go in the courtyard. The elephants are dancing and there's singers. There's, uh, you know, the devotees, they're singing kirtan, they're singing devotional hymns, like have some chai and just hang out for a while. And then you guys can decide what you want to do. And I was like, you know, really not happy. And, you know, we kind of, you know, kicking and screaming a little bit. We go into the courtyard. I don't know, we're there for maybe a half hour to an hour. And then all of a sudden there's this mad dash into the main hall, which happens to be basically 10 feet behind where I'm standing. And when I mean by mad dash, it was literally a stampede. Like so many people came running into the hall that I was lifted up off the ground, pushed backwards and then spun around to get into the door. Like that's how insane it was. So again, I'd never been to anything like this. So I had no idea it was happening, but I was like, she must be here, I guess. I mean, I don't know. So we, you know, you're getting pushed inside and there's a second floor and there's people flooding in from just all directions. I don't even know where they're coming from. And we sit down and you're sitting so close together, like you're sitting cross-legged, but everyone's knees are almost overlapping, shoulders overlapping. And we're probably like a hundred rows back. Like that's how many, and we're maybe halfway back. So we're just sitting there waiting and I'm just like looking around like, what is happening? And then the devotees are just walking around. And then all of a sudden, uh, someone comes to me and says, come, come, stand up. And I'm like, huh? Because like I'm with my few friends. So I didn't want to leave them. And they're like, come with me. I was like, okay. And then they lead me up. Like I'm literally stepping up. People, I'm sorry, I'm wow. sorry, I'm sorry. I, lead, I get led up maybe 25 rows or 50, but halfway. So I'm about halfway up. And then she just stops and goes, sit here. So I'm like, so sorry, the people around me. And I like, I squunch in, I sit down, you know, then the musicians come on and we're doing some singing. Again, this is quite some time goes by. And then another devotee comes, comes again, picks me for whatever reason and brings me all the way to the very, very front. So now I'm in the second row 
which, and then like literally I'm um, two feet away from where the stage is and this beautiful chair is, which I guess she's going to be. This little girl like rests and sits in my lap. There's a woman behind me. She starts to braid my hair and, you know, we're just singing and I'm like, I have no idea what's happening. And, and then Alma actually does come. Wow. And she gives this beautiful sermon and I end up being like the 12th person who got hugged. And in that, like the whole experience was um, such a ritual in devotion and in love that I had not experienced before by Mm. all of these strangers. And it might sound bizarre that, you know, a hug or being in this energy could be like that transformative. But um, in in many ways, it was one of the most intimate moments um, of my life, you know, and, and feeling like this direct connection or this direct Mm -hmm. channel to this pure form of love that surrounds and connects us all. Total magic. Total magic. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Number four is what is something you do for your health and wellness? Everything. (laughs) Yeah. Like you you do all the things. I do. You know, people make fun of me sometimes because they're like, wow, And I was like, I do all the things because I need all the things. Yeah. Like all the things are what make me be able to to be what I be, what I am. Yeah. So I am a big person with ritual and ritual doesn't have to be complicated. It could be as simple as lighting a candle, uh, burning some kind of, you know, incense, doing something like to me, ritual is anything that in which you bring your heart, right? Anything you do with devotion and so you can make anything a ritual and and give it and give it beautiful meaning and make it really impactful. So I have the rituals I do in the morning from as simple as lighting the candle. I have different meditation practices and uh, obviously movement practice, like movement's a huge part of my life. And um, I think what you said earlier was so beautiful of the difference between movement and exercise. And I am so, so grateful that I what made me fall in love with all the practices I do wasn't that they were exercise, but the fact that they happen to also be exercise is amazing. So I get the extra, the other benefit, but, um, being in my, finding this new way of being in relationship with my body and really tuning into feeling spirit move through me. And that's Mm -hmm. where so much of my creative ideas come from. Um, whether it's, you know, through a more traditional practice of doing downward dogs and vinyasas or dance for those of you that do know me, um, uh, movement in the form of dance is very, very, uh, powerful. So, uh, some, some days it's, it's, I have time to play one song and I just, Whatever, if I'm needing to dance out my sadness or dance out my joy or dance out my anger, I pick the track and I go for it. Um, when I have the more luxury of time, I, you know, can spend hours doing it. So I, what I always encourage people to is like, don't do something that's overcomplicated. Yeah. Like find something that you can do and commit to because it's all cumulative. A one minute practice of just attention to your breath or being in awe and wonder of the sun that's rising or setting is going to be more powerful than once a week doing a two hour anything. Completely. You know? Yes. So, yes, yeah. Yes, yes. So, my kind of whole life is to support yeah. my health and wellness. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. And, I I love that. I love that movement practice through dance too. just just putting on that putting on that playlist that you love and just Mm -hmm. feeling it just feeling it whatever you need to feel. Yeah. Yeah. Giving yourself permission to just feel it and let it move out move through. Ah, So good. So good. Okay, last question. Tell me about a moment you knew magic was real. Ooh, That's a good one. Um, I'm, okay, so this is this is definitely not the first moment, but this is the moment that's popping into my head. Sure. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share it. Um, this was I don't know maybe 15 years ago. I I was I was elsewhere in the world, but before I left, I had gone to the the I no let me rewind. I had gotten a, I gotten a tarot reading from this amazing person. It was one of my first ones. And that was probably like, I've, I've believed in the magical tools, you know, I believe in divin- divination. How do you say that? Do, the you know divination tools. Think? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, I think I believed in it so much, but I hadn't maybe had the direct experience, so sure. to speak. But, um, so I had this, um, reading and one of the things the woman said to me is that you have, um, arc- 
Archangel Raphael around you. Oh, wow. And at any time that you're feeling like when your circumstances are too much or you're needing healing in your life on whatever level, I just want you to imagine literally like jumping on um, his wings and and flying off, right? Like, but wow. like knowing he's got you. And I was like, okay. And like surround yourself in this emerald green light and so on and so forth. So I, you know, I was kind of doing this little, you know, prayer to him. And then I had a little health scare that um, I was, and I was just going for a regular checkup and I was on the road and then I got called and they're like, you need to go back to your primary doctor to get this checked out because um, this is, you know, not okay. And I'm like, oh, I'm out of the country. They're like, you need to come home. Like this can't wait. Mm -hmm. So at that time I didn't have a primary doctor. So literally searching on Google to whoever I could get into as fast as possible. And of course I was scared because I'm like, who am I going to get? Like somebody that actually isn't good. And so finally found someone, got in a few days later, and this is in Los Angeles, and I go into his office, and or the the nurse brings me into his office, and I'm I'm in there alone, and around the room, he has crystals everywhere. He has angel wings everywhere, and he has statues of which I didn't know at the time were Mark Angel Raphael. Okay. So <laughs> he comes over, we're talking and he was super nice. And I was like, I like your crystals. He's like, oh yeah. And uh, he's like, I don't mention them unless someone mentions them to me first. Cause you know, we're in LA and blah, blah, blah. And then he's wearing a medallion around his neck. And I said, can I ask about your medallion? And he said, yes, it's Archangel Raphael. Um, he's who I channel to do my healing work. And it was in that moment, I knew I was going to be okay. And I was. Wow. Yeah. So to I, me, like, that's the story like, of yes, magic. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, this has You're been so welcome. much fun. I've loved getting to spend time with you and get to know you. And I'm so excited about the book. So excited. Likewise. Yeah. Thank you so much. It means so much to me. My pleasure. My pleasure. So if someone wants to find the book or find out more about yes. you, where shall we send them? Um, the, the great, a great place to go is my website, Christy Um, there is a pop-up immediately for the book and that will, Perfect. um, also take you to the website for the book, which is chakra rituals.com. And it's available at every retailer possible and I have a ton of bonus gifts for those of you that do pre-order, um, in advance. So, um, I hope you will, and I hope you love it and I hope it supports your life in a really beautiful, empowering, rich and awakening way. Thank you so much. I've loved having you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yes, mine as well. All right. Thanks, Christy. Bye-bye. And with that, we are complete. It's a wrap on this episode. I've had so many messages over this last six months of us recording this show asking how you can support the show. The number one way to support the show is to leave us a review and subscribe to the show. So whether that is on Spotify or Apple Pods or Google Pods or wherever it is you get your podcast, you can get it on Audible. There's lots of ways. Make sure you are subscribed to the show. That is the number one way you can support us. If you really want to go above and beyond, share this episode on your social media channels, tag us at your woo woo BFF, and you can tag us at wee wee girl as well. That's my page and share the episode, pass it along to a friend who you feel like would love to hear Christy's story, who would love to pick up Christy's book. And that is how, my friends, you can support us. Five-star reviews mean everything to us. If you leave us a review, take a screenshot and post it over in your social and tag us so we can see and we will definitely share and give you a shout out. So much gratitude for those that have done that. We love you. We love you. We love you. All right. I'll be back again next week. Next week's episode is with one of the women on my team. And we are bringing you this episode because truly everyone needs a woo-woo BFF. And we got to be hers. We really got to be hers when she joined our team. She got to explore modalities and experiences that otherwise she perhaps would not have. And we're going to talk about that and what that was like joining the team and having an opportunity to create 
more openness in her life through some of these practices. So it's a, it's going to be really fun. It's definitely an episode not to miss. Okay. I love you all. I'll see you again super soon. Until next time. Oh, 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 oh,